Okay, why don't we get started? Um, my name's Kathy Leaders. I'm the Commercial Crew Program Manager. Um, one of my, uh, and here with me today is Hans Koenigsman from SpaceX and John Mulholland from Boeing. Um, I will give you a little bit more of an introduction with them. Um, first, I wanted to uh, let you know about the Commercial Crew Program. The Commercial Crew Program is a, a new program for NASA where we are working to certify commercial space transportation capabilities to be able to safely and reliably fly our crew, NASA crew, to the International Space Station. And so I'm very pleased to have up here on the panel with me Hans Koenigsman, who is the VP for Mission Assurance for SpaceX. Um, I don't think people realize this, but Hans, um, in the SpaceX uh, culture, they, they keep track of the number of employees. And I think Hans, you're number four, which means he's been there from the very beginning. Uh, that's correct, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he was just telling me today that he's had the honor of working for Elon for over 13 years. And so, Hans, we're glad to see you sitting here today. And, and you've been supporting, obviously, the development of the new launch capabilities and the cargo transportation and now the crew transportation to the International Space Station. In addition, we have John Mohan from Boeing. John is the VP and Program Manager for Commercial Space for Boeing. And um, uh, John and I actually used to work together at White Sands. Um, I can probably say I worked for John for four years and uh, am glad to have survived that occasion. And there may be a few, uh, um, I won't tell too many stories today, but um, I'm pleased that John is now leading the team, the Boeing team that is also working to deliver our new crew transportation systems to the International Space Station. So let me jump in with a few slides, uh, letting you guys know where we are from a commercial crew program standpoint. And then really the point of today is for both of these gentlemen to be letting you know what they're doing to deliver these new capabilities that are vital to NASA. So let's make sure I don't mess this up here. So first, so commercial crew programs, a uh, little bit different program. Um, uh, like the folks Robert had explained in the, the opening executive session this morning, we are an, an integral part of the overall NASA strategy. We're working to really hand over transportation of our crew members to the commercial industry so that NASA can be focused on really making the exploration missions um, a reality. And so, but one of the key aspects and really um, We've been, uh, both of these companies have really enabled us to fulfill this, the first one of our goals, which is of cost effectiveness. And so both of these companies have come in with a cost effective and reliable and, and safe crew transportation capability. And um, really what that allows us to do is to increase our focus on science on the International Space Station. I don't think people realize this, but when, these folks start flying their vehicles, we'll be able to fly not just the current three crew members that we fly on Soyuz, but also be able to fly an additional crew member which will enable us to double the amount of crew time that we allocate to science on the International Space Station. So this is a critical aspect of the crew transportation capabilities that both Boeing and SpaceX will be bringing to NASA. Um, the other key thing is that we are returning the transportation of our crew members to U.S. industry. And so you can see at the bottom there just how, um, how much of the U.S. is involved in providing these crew transportation capabilities. And so it is not just, um, you know, one place. The, the capability is really coming out of over 35 states. Um, and 350 plus companies are contributing to returning the U.S. to the, the job of flying our crew. So within NASA, we've been working hard to get ready for the commercial crew vehicles that will be delivering our crew members. On On Orbit Station, um, they're recently we relocated um, our, 
are um, pressurized. Um, uh, and the PMM, the relocation from unity to, to tranquility. We've, there's been numerous spacewalks. There's been over 19 hours of EVA time. We've had to remap and, and lay out cabling, um, four antennas, three laser reflectors, and more and more reconfiguration to come. Um, coming up are us installing the docking adapters and installing new um, communication systems that will be then the key links to these new crew transportation capabilities. So one of the key things is you know, in the commercial crew program is us really working with these companies. And so through our working relationship with them and following along with what they're doing and ensuring that we're making, that they're meeting our critical safety requirements, we are then able to certify their systems to be able to then fly our crew members. Um, we also are working now towards not only meeting, understanding how they're planning on meeting our certification requirements, but we also are in the process of laying the foundation of the post-certification missions that will be coming up. So we've already ordered one post-certification mission from Boeing. Um, we're in the process of ordering the first certification missions from SpaceX. And because of the lead time um, that Boeing has, we'll be in the process of looking at the second missions for both Boeing and then following because of the lead time for SpaceX, the second missions for SpaceX. So not only are we working towards certifications and the demo missions that these providers have, we're also starting to lay the groundwork for the, the service and the rotation missions that, the crew rotation missions that they will be providing us in the International Space Station. Um, in addition, what's really critical with the commercial crew program is we not only have partnerships with our industry providers, but we have key partnerships with the FAA, with the NTSB. Um, we work with the Air Force on their certification tactics, and we obviously work within NASA with the other key um, NASA programs like the Launch Service Program and obviously the International Space Station Program. One of the key things that we just recently did was NASA actually named what we, we're calling our crew cadre. And these four folks are the Doug and Eric and Bob and Sonny are the, the four crew members out of which we will pick and assign the, the crew allocations for the Boeing crew test mission and the SpaceX crew te test mission. So what's really critical is now you can start seeing the faces of the crew members that these companies will be flying on their crewed test missions. We've come to this program with different backgrounds and different experiences. We have a chance to build upon a new launch capability for America part of a partnership and part of the partnership is to have uh, different abilities and so the United States having access is uh, extremely important to the effort. One of the things that really gave us the opportunity to, to be ready for this is all those systems on the space station or on the space shuttle that we had to learn in order to be prepared for a space flight. So it really has set us up for a mindset of learning new things and being ready for whatever comes at us. huge team here at NASA as well as the great teams at SpaceX and Boeing that we'll work with to try to make this vehicle as safe as possible. Building that partnership, that relationship where we are uh, uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, with these companies as they build this vehicle is really going to be how we're instrumental in making sure the vehicles are ready for the first flights when the time comes. I'm honored to get the opportunity to participate with this uh, new group and to work with the team to get us onto this uh, next era in spaceflight. I remember when I launched from Kennedy the first time uh, on a U.S. space shuttle and it was pretty amazing so I can only imagine what it's going to be like after this long period of time to get back on a spacecraft at Kennedy and have all family and friends and people from all over the country watching. That's going to be pretty special. And so bringing back home will bring that back home to everybody here. It'll be a pretty exciting moment.
are getting pretty excited because, like I tell my team, we right now, today, are getting ready for the missions we will be doing with these companies tomorrow. And so, as you can see from the video, the crew is getting excited about flying on these vehicles, and we're very excited to finally be able to, once again, fly our crew from U.S. soil. And so, um, right now, Hans, I'm going to start with you and uh, allow you to let some folks know some of the progress that you within SpaceX have been making. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Kathy. I, uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, just in general, it's, uh, it's incredibly exciting and, uh, yeah, um, yeah, exciting to work on, on uh, Crew Dragon, Crew Dragon in general, commercial crew. Um, I do have a couple slides, uh, maybe, let's see, this way. And just in general, a little overview about SpaceX. We, we have been founded with human spaceflight in, in, in mind and uh, with the, uh, the really long-term goal to make life multiplanetary, and we're thinking um, primarily about Mars uh, on that. We design, we design rockets and, uh, and spacecraft. Um, the most uh, known one, I think, is Falcon 9 on the left side. And then, uh, you know, we, we also have uh, Falcon Heavy in work. And, uh, you know, in this case, the uh, Dragon spacecraft is on top of Falcon 9 to be launched to the ISS. Uh, always an exciting mission. The, uh, one of the things that we're also pushing very hard is uh, reusability. We believe that you should reuse spacecraft as much as you possibly can. And so we're trying to land first stages. Uh, that is something you can see on the right side. Uh, where the, uh, I think this is CRS-6, um, is trying to land on the drone ship. We have uh, 60 missions, missions on the manifest right now. Uh, we have, uh, SpaceX has grown over the years. I, I, joined, space, I joined SpaceX uh, 13 years ago. Um, <laughs> we were really small at the time. And now we have 4,000 employees uh, at eight different locations. The um, primary location is Hawthorne here in, uh, in the South Bay. Um, right next to the Hawthorne Airport. And um, then the, uh, there's, of course, the launch site in Cape Canaveral and uh, Vandenberg. And there's also the test site back in, uh, in Texas at McGregor. In general, um, things we, you know, we, we think our, our core values are basically safety, reliability, reusability, and all around innovation. That's uh, what we stand for. Uh, let's see. Falcon 9 missions, um, prior to CRS-7 um, flight, there were 18 successful missions in a row on Falcon 9, and 13 of those were um, on the version that we call the 1.1 version. Um, we continue to learn and we continue to apply those lessons, um, and then we improve launch, the launch vehicle, and, uh, and the same is true to some extent for Dragon. Um, we have 180 engines uh, flown today. Those engines are built built in America, they built right here in, in, in Hawthorne, they tested in, uh, in McGregor in Texas, turned around, integrated back in the, uh, what we call the Octaweb, is the uh, thrust uh, frame on the engine, uh, on, the, on the vehicle, and then sent back to Texas again, test fired again, and then sent off to the launch site. So that's a lot of test firing and a uh, um, lot of tests in general um, in, our, uh, in our strategy, and that is part of um, how we push reliability. Um, we will fly another 50 times between, um, between now and before we do the first manned, um, or, yeah, first human flight on, uh, on, the, on the Crew Dragon. Um, and uh, down there is just a whole list of uh, vehicles that we flew. I was, um, I was launch chief engineer for the majority of those, probably for um, uh, all except two or three. Dragon missions, um, equally, there's uh, eight successful Dragon flights. Um, basically, eight, eight more are planned over the next two years. I'm always amazed how you come from a company that has you know, a phone line and uh, you know, four cubicles, and then, and then 10 years later, you start, you start your Dragon vehicle to the, to the ISS, and, and you know, the next flight or the next after that, you actually dock on the ISS. That's just, just incredible. Um, and then, of course, the next logical step, in my opinion, is um, putting, putting crew in. If you look at the very first Dragon there on the left side, it had a window. 
and uh, <laughs> that, that window was more statement than, than anything else. The cargo inside did not really need a window. It was more showing that, yes, we do want to fly um, humans. We, this, is, this is what we, um, we wanted to do from the get-go. Um, so the um, commercial crew overall has a couple more elements. It, it includes the uh, Crew Dragon, it includes Falcon 9, but it also includes the, uh, the ground launch system, which is basically the launch site. Um, in this case, it's going to be um, LC-39A, the, the old um, shuttle pad. It used to be the old Apollo pad, um, heavily converted, obviously, to what we need for Falcon 9. Um, and then, of course, there's also the, the whole operational element, um, which includes a um, ground control, mission control, rather, a, um, a line um, connection to, to JSC, and, um, and a lot more on infrastructure that's uh, not really that visible as the, the launch system, but equally important. Um, again, we can carry up to seven crew members, or four to five, basically, plus cargo, and um, those cargo can, can be um, powered if, if needed. Um, it has, Dragon has a, a, an escape system that is really unique too. It uses the, um, what's called the Super Draco um, thruster um, to push the, uh, the vehicle away from the launch, from, the, from Falcon 9 in case uh, something may happen to Falcon 9. And I'm going to show you in a second the uh, video of the paddleboard that we had earlier this year in May. Um, the, uh, if you if you, if you don't, the, the, there's a couple advantages on using this, this type of um, abort system, because if you don't use the abort system, you can actually use it to do a propulsive landing. Um, that is what we are, what we are now um, testing and, um, and uh, exploring. However, the, um, the, the uh, Crew Dragon will initially land on a parachute and in the water, very traditionally, very safe, um, the, the way most spacecraft uh, you know, most human human flight spacecraft have done this in the past. Um, and last but not least, uh, Dragon is capable of staying uh, 210 days uh, up on the ISS uh, before it has to return back to Earth. Uh, flights upcoming, um, we have a demo flight to the ISS without crew um, coming up in, uh, this is the end of 16-ish, uh, we have an in-flight abort test after that, and then we have a demo flight uh, two to the ISS, this time with crew um, after, the, after those two first flights. Overall goal, um, restore the uh, U.S. crew carrying capability by 2017. Uh, let's see how this works. 10, this is a, 9, let's see, 40, 8, 7, this is the old 6, Five, four, three, two, one, launch. Right now, 150 meters per second. Slightly below nominal. We're over one kilometer. Chunk deploy. Chugs look good. Sequencing the mains. Passing through 600 meters. Downrange distance. Thanks, now she's in purple. She's close.
what we learned and uh, what we learned from the test was incredible, and uh, we, we're ready to take the next step there and, uh, and continue the uh, dragon dragon development, good dragon development, rather. Okay, actually, it's me, not him. Okay. Um, all right, so it's, um, it's basically a, a lot of experience also on, on Cargo Dragon goes to Crew Dragon. It, it helps if you fly uh, multiple times a year to the station. You learn a lot about operations. You learn a lot about fault tolerance, what's important, what can go wrong, and, and which parts you can trust, which parts. How do you put parts together so that they're, they're actually truly redundant and that, you know, that's, that's all stuff you learn when you do continuous um, you know, missions to the, to the station. Um, again, I mentioned um, flying up to seven crew members. Um, it's gonna be less crew members, obviously, in the beginning. Um, we talked about propulsive land, and uh, one thing that, that I haven't mentioned is we, we're working also on precision reentry guidance, and the idea is if you do land on land, then obviously you wanna land on the right spot and not, uh, not uh, you know, miles, miles left or right. On the water landing, it's not quite that important. You just make sure that all boats are within, you know, outside within certain miles. Um, we minimize mechanisms and any deployment um, there. That, that um, increases reliability and, and therefore safety too. Uh, and then again, we, we work very hard on, um, on reusability. 90% of the capsule basically is, uh, is reusability, uh, reus re reusable. Um, all right, um, let's see. That is all I had. Yes. All right. Thank you, Hans. Thank you. Um, John, you want to share all the work that you guys have been doing? Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. And Hans, congratulations on all the work you well, guys have done to date. Kathy, um, great partnership with NASA, and we appreciate everything you guys have helped uh, us be able to accomplish. It's a great partnership. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll go ahead and go on to the next chart. I might need help here. It's amazing the stuff that we're able to do. I don't think there's any industry that builds more passion in the workforce than, than human spaceflight. It's just fun to work on almost every day. Um, hey, the key for us is we look to the evolution of the commercial human space market, obviously is partnership with the destination. Right? Your transportation capability is, uh, is not really required unless you have a destination. And, and we continue to work with uh, partners like Bigelow Aerospace and other potential users. Um, but really the foundation of this market, at least for the next um, decade, is gonna be NASA and the International Space Station. It really is a win-win with NASA. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, it allows a larger crew size, a lot more focus on, on science and the ability to get the return on ISS as we look to uh, extend that to, to 2028 or beyond. From a, from a concept of operations, um, 
you know, we have taken over with partnership of Space Florida the old orbiter processing facility. And so we're currently doing manufacturing uh, in that facility. Um, we are using the Atlas V launch vehicle. And, and so all of the production and launch will be you know, down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, you know, we have designed our capsule to be uh, capable of launching on other launch vehicles in, the, in that class. Uh, but the Atlas V was a natural um, choice for us, at least for our early missions, uh, because of its unparalleled uh, technical and schedule reliability. Uh, 55 launches to date, all with 100% success. Um, normally we'll do a flight day one rendezvous, we'll certify to stay up on the ISS for up to six months. Uh, when it's time to come home, we'll um, separate from the ISS, do a deorbit maneuver, uh, and come down through a combination of parachutes and airbags uh, through one, at one of five landing sites in the western part of the United States. Uh, a lot of work right now moving from um, spacecraft design to production and, and integrated qualification testing. Uh, so in the top, uh, on, the, on the left and the right, uh, we're right in the middle of building up our structural test article. So the first piece of integrated, fully flight designed uh, hardware is coming together. Uh, that'll be shipped out to, uh, to California and we'll do our structural testing at the Huntington Beach facility uh, here in the Los Angeles area. Uh, starting in early spring. So pretty exciting to see uh, the real hardware come together. Uh, we'll start getting some of our big bone pieces uh, for the structure for the qualification test vehicle. That'll be, uh, they'll be coming in in December, January timeframe. We'll have feeder line work going on obviously before that. Um, and we'll deliver the qual test vehicle uh, out to the El Segundo facility uh, in, in early May of this year as we kick off that qual test vehicle summary. So pretty exciting. Um, as important as, as some of the structural work, we've got a great complement of, uh, of aerospace industry leaders that have partnered with us that, uh, that right now uh, are in various phases of development test finalization and, and qualification tests. We've already uh, been through several qualification tests on, on some of our components, so we're starting to see uh, a lot of momentum, momentum picking up as we, as we get to uh, flight design hardware delivery. Uh, on the bottom is the, uh, as we continue to uh, mature and, and outfit the old orbiter processing facility, right now we've got uh, one of the sections of the old OPF-3, the old engine shop that is currently producing the structural test article and the service module. Uh, we'll be finished with the high bay modernization uh, in December of this year, uh, which then will take over the, uh, the buildup of the, of the spacecraft going forward. So a lot of work out at the Kennedy Space Center with hardware and with our industry teammates uh, across the country. Launch accommodations, I did mention uh, the selection of ULA for, uh, as our launch vehicle. Uh, a lot of work going on the, to um, to outfit LC-41 uh, to be able to handle crew launches. Obviously, um, for cargo launches, you don't need a crew access tower. For crew, you do. And uh, with ULA, we partnered on a design that, uh, for that tower. Uh, and to be able to, um, to design, build, and then install it in between their, their already busy manifest, uh, we actually built up the, uh, the seven big sections. And you can see uh, those big sections of the crew access tower. Uh, about a mile away from LC-41. Uh, they've laid the 300, 300 yards of concrete at LC-41 to be able to handle that crew access tower. Uh, and those pieces will start getting erected uh, here within the next several weeks uh, in between uh, their launch manifest. So a lot of work going on, um, getting ready at um, both the spacecraft side and on the facility side. From a milestone standpoint, yeah, I did mention that we are, uh, will be nominally landing on land through a combination of parachutes and airbags. Uh, but with an ascent abort, uh, if one were required, you'd obviously have to ditch into the water. And so our, our vehicle will be also certified to, uh, to go into the water. And we just finished a pretty aggressive campaign out of the Langley Research Center uh, for water drops. Uh, we've had... Um, you know, a number of wind tunnel tests already, just going through that validation phase of our design, and we've got about four more wind tunnel tests coming up uh, that'll finish that entire campaign. And over on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the buildup again of that structural test article in, the, in their facility on 
the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, you know, looking ahead, I did mention the um, the crew access tower and uh, and the erection that will be uh, continuing on there. Um, our qualification series for our uh, for our parachute will take uh, about ten more uh, additional parachute drops, um, and so we'll be going through the qualification on those and and obviously the rest of the hardware. Uh, continued hot fire tests so we can certify uh, the entire propulsion system. We'll be building up. Um, you know, a, f a full flight version of our service module and sending that out to White Sands uh, for an integrated um, propulsion qualification test series. Uh, our QTV, or qual test vehicle I mentioned that will be uh, uh, ready and first power on in, uh, in May of next year. Uh, and then immediately following that will be in uh, production of the, uh, the uncrewed and the crewed test capsules. Uh, so pretty exciting time. And then 2017, you know, we'll transition from you know, the qualification of hardware and system buildup to, um, uh, to that test or the flight validation. So we'll have our paddleboard test, uncrewed flight test, crewed flight test, and then the services, the first uh, crewed services flight all in 2017. So a lot of momentum, a lot of energy, um, and a lot of product coming together. It's pretty exciting. And I think that's all I had. Thank you. I think the thing that's really cool about this is how much hardware you both were showing. I mean, um, uh, if we're both, if we're all three back here in another year, it's you're going to be seeing all the vehicles that you guys are getting ready for your demo missions, and it's going to be phenomenal um, to show the progress that they're continuing to make as we're kind of doing our mission countdown as we get ready for crew transportation services. Um, tremendous effort by both of these companies. So we're going to get into some questions. Um, unfortunately, I'm kind of noticing that the largest number of questions uh, kind of tend to be for me. So, but I'm not, yeah. <laughs> unless you guys want to talk about my funding or anything else like that. Um, so let me start off with a couple for you guys. Um, so um, why don't you each of you talk about uh, reusability and what that means in for your particular crew transportation strategy. Maybe John, I can start with you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, incredibly important from a spacecraft standpoint. Um, our, the, but we've got a mixture of, of expendable and reusability. So our, our spacecraft will be um, you know, two pieces, the, the crew module itself, the pressurized capsule for crew. That'll be certified for uh, reuse up to 10 times. Um, and, and really, the, uh, what allowed us to reuse that from a design standpoint um, is our baseline of coming down on the land landing, right, through the, through the parachutes and airbags. Um, you know, the baseline, obviously, if you ditch into the water, would, would not be reusability, just because of the uncertainty on loads. So the capsule will be reused up to 10 times, which is really important from a business case, business case standpoint um, to try and drive, uh, you know, the cost as, as low as reasonable. Uh, but the service module with the propulsion system uh, will be expendable. Um, and so we'll be building a new one of those every flight uh, just because of the difficulty uh, and the size of the capsule that would be required to, to bring all of that home. It just made more sense uh, from a business standpoint to, uh, to separate those out. So um, on, on the Dragon side, um, we, uh, we'll be targeting full reusability long term, um, obviously with propulsive land landing. Um, the, uh, the trunk is uh, not reusable, but the trunk also contains as little hardware as possible. It is primarily, in the, in the case of the board, a passive stabilization. It aerodynamically stabilizes. As you could see in the paddleboard video, you saw how it basically um, started tumbling the moment you, you, you deploy the trunk. Um, and then also the, the trunk has solar, solar power on, on the surface um, to help Dragon, um, Dragon's power budget. So on Dragon side, as much as possible, the full propulsive um, element is all inside the vehicle. Batteries are all inside Dragon, a Dragon, a Dragon vehicle. Um, but um, one, one important thing is not to stop there, but either go, go beyond that and look at your first stage. And that is something that we've been trying, <laughs> as, far, as far as I rec can recall, ever since um, beginning Falcon 1 and Falcon 9, of course, um, trying to get the first stage back as a first step. Um, which is, uh, it's, it's a very difficult task, and we've gotten pretty close um, a couple of times so far. So I'm, I'm convinced um, 
that we will be able to, to recover the first stage fully and basically uh, inspect it and, and turn it around. Our, our vision is, is, is really going into an airplane-like operation, um, understanding that, that airplanes and, and rockets are obviously um, quite, quite different, but um, trying to push rocket or launch technology more closer towards an airplane-type operation um, and, and trying to avoid, you know, just imagine you would throw this airplane away every time you cross the country. Uh, it would just be a little bit more expensive than it already is. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, for, that's our, um, our principle. We use as much as we can, as often as we can. Uh, a lot of that is uh, something we need to find out in the next uh, couple of months. But uh, we are determined to, to push reusability as hard as we can. So our number one question is, uh, how extensible is commercial crew to destinations beyond ISS? Um, and so I think that the, what the question is getting at is, is this model, how, from your perspective, how applicable do you think this model could be for other programs and, and use um, from an exploration perspective? So. Um, Looks like John, you're you're thinking already. So well, I'll I mean, let, I'll give Hans a few more minutes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's imperative that, that we expand the business space beyond NASA, right? Because uh, space station will have a finite life, right? NASA is looking to um, to go beyond low Earth orbit and do a combination of Orion and, and other platforms as as they move forward um, on their way to Mars. So it is going to be, I think, incredibly important for us to. Um, to help that market evolve. There are a lot of countries out there that are currently not part of the International Space Station Partnership. And so there's a, there's a lot of room there, a lot of interest worldwide to, um, to become a spacefaring nation. So I think there's a lot of capability there. Um, you know, Hans has talked some about uh, trying to drive the cost of launch down lower. And, and as we see you know, that happen with um, uh, with SpaceX and, and other launch vehicle providers, I think you know, that's really going to be a market enabler for, for other destinations um, and other users. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, the to totally right. Uh, as, as soon as you get the launch costs down to a reasonable level, you can get more into Earth orbit. You can, can put it together there, and you can send, send obviously, um, larger ships towards Mars. Um, it's no question uh, SpaceX uh, wants to go to Mars. Elon uh, said that several times, and I think the whole company is behind him and, and, uh, and uh, working very hard on that. Um, in terms of, of um, Crew Dragon, um, I would, the way I see that is we will, learn, we will learn how to make really good crew vehicles on, on Crew Dragon, and then we will, um, we will take the next step from there. So um, I think it's definitely on the way, on the way to Mars for us. So there's, there's been a lot of uh, questions about um, investment and about relative investment um, from a corporate standpoint. I don't know if you, either one of you would be willing to kind of talk about under this model, um, your investment strategies and um, how they have played into the kind of the shared risk with the government. I'm an engineer. Okay. <laughs> 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 John, <laughs> I'm with Hans. You're gonna try it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you know, it, it, it is important, right? Um, this is NASA's um, from a from a crew transportation system. This is NASA's first entrance into a fixed price development program. Uh, successfully worked on cargo, and, and so now they're they're moving it into crew. Uh, that in and of itself, I think, um, uh, pushes more risk to industry. Right, and, um, and and we've been able to work very closely with NASA to do it. It was always um, important for NASA that, that we have a significant amount of investment and, and skin in the game um, from their standpoint. And so we have absolutely stepped up to that. Um, you know, the level of that, I don't think um, you know anyone from our company would be comfortable with me publicly stating. But uh, there has been significant risk sharing and cost sharing. To make this program successful, yeah, just a follow up on my side. So, uh, SpaceX was founded with basically private capital, and uh, and and uh, and there's there's a significant amount of uh, 
non-government funding, uh, you know, putting, putting skin in the game is, I think, the key, the, really the key thing. And, um, and part of that is also um, having fixed firm price contracts because that, that really forces you to be competitive, to, to do uh, great work from the get-go, and this is your incentive to actually finish your job safely and reliable in the end. Yeah, they're giving us some tough questions. So, <laughs> I know. Um, so, what are some of the current issues you're facing, and, and what are kind of the near-term obstacles that you see over this next year, um, John? Yeah, you know, we're working, you know, obviously really hard right now, as as I mentioned, to get into structural test article and qual test vehicle testing. Now, as with any any large, complex, integrated qualification test campaign, you're going to have discoveries, right? And so it's uh, it's trying to to make sure that we maintain really close communication with all of our um, all of our industry providers and partners, um, so that we we stay completely in sync. We're trying to drive margin into the schedule so that we make sure we have you know, the ability to learn uh, from these tests without significant interruption to, uh, to our test schedule. So it's mainly about communication with the entire commercial crew team and, um, and, and trying to make sure that uh, you have the right test, um, but you have the capability to learn without a big perturbation. Yeah, we, we just finished um, avionics uh, test bed uh, simulations, basically. Uh, we continue to do simulations for the full flight, basically. Um, we, um, we are in the midst of uh, propulsion module testing, which will uh, close out pretty quickly. There's also um, docking adapter test ongoing on. So there's a lot of things, as, as John said, you know, at the same time and a uh, lot of, lot of uh, things in the air that uh, we need to balance. And of course, um, you do learn things when you do tests uh, and, and then you go, go around and, and uh, improve and, and make it better for the next go around. So um, that things that can happen are like test results that aren't quite what you expect, although so far um, things are looking really great on, 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 on our side in terms of uh, schedule and uh, technical readiness. So there's a question about um with uh, milestones being altered and delayed, um, uh, why should we be confident you can still be ready by 2017, even with full funding? So I think maybe you can talk about the, the progress that you guys have been making from a milestone perspective. And, um, and I think the other thing is, I think obviously going and working through demo missions um, is, is obviously a, a big challenge doing the multiple missions in that one particular year. So, uh, John, I don't know if you want to talk any about that, or? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I think, you know, with any um, complex development program, there, there will be learning that goes along the way. Um, you, one of our, the biggest adjustments that we've had, you know, on the schedule when we, um, when we first proposed, we had assumed a start date of, of uh, July 1st. Right, as, as NASA went through the uh, proposal evaluation period, obviously they, um, that decision uh, wasn't made until mid-September, right? And then we had uh, a little perturbation with, um, with the protest period. So we kind of got off to, uh, to a little bit slower start than we expected, and so we had to uh, you know, basically iron bar that schedule for, uh, for that time lost. Um, and then as we move through with, the, with that re-baseline, um, you know, we, we've had some learning. We've adjusted some of the um, some of our milestones uh, to be more efficient as we look forward and, and to get more learning. Um, but the team has uh, has largely produced, um, you know, per plan. Uh, we're we're pretty close. And um, what's really important now and gives us a lot more confidence uh, looking forward on the schedule is is we're actually now producing those uh, integrated qualification test vehicles, right? So it is coming together. The design is closing and you're in manufacturing. And, uh, and so obviously the focus now is, is making sure that we're doing all of the right testing um, and design validation so that we don't have big discoveries in those integrated tests. Because that would be the next risk of, uh, of a potential schedule move uh, is big discoveries in those tests. Yeah, um, I guess if you ever did uh, big projects um, that are related to to launch, 
then you would know that in the end you need to slow down a little bit and, um, and actually look at your system again because I think, I think the question is actually um, is this safe and is this reliable and not necessarily is this on time and, uh, and at the right date. I think at, at a certain point in time when you got the vehicle together, you started testing it, then you need to actually step back a little bit and look at it and say, is this all safe? You know, did I do all the right steps to make the most reliable vehicle? Does the redundancy work? Have you thought everything through? And these are big systems. These are really um, complicated systems. And um, in the past, it's always been that, that those systems slip a little bit in time. I think, like, like John said, on our side, we've also been pretty good so far. We got the, the, the Paderborn test off. That obviously is a, is a major, major milestone. To, and, um, but I, I really think the focus should rather be safety and reliability and not necessarily a milestone schedule. Yeah, and I think that's, um, if we're not flying safely, we're not, we're not kind of meeting our overall goal. The, the goal is really to fly when it's the right time. And um, obviously NASA will be working with both these companies to make sure that we understand when that is and so that we can, we can time it so that we're flying, that you're flying our crew when you can do it safely. Um, so uh, there's a question about the, uh, each of your um, plans for launching reentry suits or what your strategy is for um, supplying the suits. Um, do you guys want to talk briefly about that? All right. Um, I actually don't know the details, but I do know that there are suits being made at SpaceX. Um, there's a suit qualification. I think it is the next year, um, but I don't really know exactly. Um, and our goal is to produce those suits um, as, as an integrated system together with Dragon, basically, so they fit together. Uh, you, you can make sure that if, if something fails on Dragon, you can recover um, by, by having the right suit on there. And then also, you know, this, this goes a little bit in line with what we, what we like to do at SpaceX. If there's something critical, then we just start working on it early and uh, work it very hard so that at the end we have the ability to get the suit um, f at our own price and at our own schedule. Yeah, we, we partner with David Clark, so they're going to be working with us on the design of the suit. Again, kind of that same philosophy of trying to bring you know, the best of industry together. So there is a question about, um, there's been obviously a lot of discussion about the commercial crew budget. Um, I think uh, uh, one thing that I wanted to say is, uh, you know, the NASA and the agency has been working diligently for us to be able to get our commercial crew budget. Um, I think the nice thing about a fixed price contract is that we can show, absolutely show the, the funding requirements that both of you provided us during the proposal period that showed what, what we needed to fund the contract with to make sure that you're making the progress that you need to make. And so um, that's the nice thing about a fixed price contract. NASA actually has the information that they need to understand what um, funding the contractors needed to be able to meet their schedule needs. And so um, with um, when we understand what the actual budget is, then we will be working with our partners to make sure that um, we then work to mitigate any impacts that any, if there is a reduction in the budget, um, that we mitigate that because we absolutely, from a NASA perspective, understand the criticality of us being able to fly the NASA crew members to the International Space Station to be able to really support the International Space Station's mission. And, and that time frame is, is very clear. We know when we have the ability to buy seats and when we don't. And, um, and our schedules laid out so that we feel like we are giving both these companies the prudent time to be able to demonstrate and safely fly their vehicles. So, uh, so we're confident that our, uh, that our congressional support will understand that and will work forward to um, providing us that capability. Okay. Um, so uh, how is certification of these commercial vehicles um, kind of different from the shuttle? So I think, um, John, you had worked on Orbiter. Um, I know that, that as a NASA, as a goal, our goal is, is to have 
the, the certification activity be different. I guess I'd like to hear your perspective on whether it is different or whether we've kind of accomplished our goal or not. So maybe you can say a few words. You know, I, that. I, I think, you know, beyond the certification of the hardware, because that, you know, that's a well-defined um, activity, right? I mean, we've, we've had great efficiency um, in, in the development cycle, more so than, than we've had in, in past um, human spaceflight programs. You know, the real key is, um, is decision velocity and decision stability, right? And, and driving to good requirements up front that NASA has that uh, minimizes the change, right? That, that really drives um, a lot of problems into, uh, especially fixed price programs. Um, and, and having the right people um, get together quickly and make the design decisions necessary to move forward, right? And then have those decisions be stable. You know, that's really been the big difference. When, when we look at um, the integrity of the hardware and the certification of the hardware, um, you don't see big differences. You don't see really any differences in the validation methodology that we used on Orbiter, uh, that we used in the commercial airplane industry. Um, you know, because they're really, you're focused on making sure you can verify uh, all of the performance requirements of the hardware and do it safely. So you, you can't cut corners in that activity. And so there isn't a difference between the certification philosophy uh, or activity, I would say, between this and other human spaceflight missions. Okay, um, can each of you talk about what your strategy is for crew um, complement on the first, your first crew test missions? And, and it'd be interesting to hear, I think, why you picked the complement the way you did. So, um, and Hans is looking at me like, I know. <laughs> so um, maybe John, you can talk about that because SpaceX is actually flying uh, two NASA crew members. So I think your, your option is a little bit different, John. Um, and so why did, why did Boeing go with the crew complement it did? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, for, the, for the crew test flight, our plan right now is to fly a Boeing uh, astronaut with a NASA astronaut. Um, and it's just that full, full buy-in and involvement in the design. Uh, I think it was, it was important for us to, um, to step up and uh, uh, with crew being completely involved in the design and us being part of that, that first test flight. Obviously, as we move from the crew test flight to the, uh, the services flights, it'll be you know, more of that rental car model with, with NASA as the crew. But for the first test flight, uh, we just wanted to have a combination. And Hans, I'm surprised Garrett didn't try to talk you guys into letting yeah, I, him fly. I don't think he did, right? No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, okay, I think uh, just a couple more questions. Um, so, Hans, is SpaceX planning to phase out the production of the Cargo Dragon, or will Crew Dragon be modified to deliver cargo? That's uh, going to be a mix um, between Crew Dragon and Cargo Dragon, the transitional phase, and then. Um, I guess our long-term goal is to, to go back to one vehicle. Okay. Um, let me see. I think we're kind of getting this. The rest of these are, are, are really questions about uh, compatibility um, with the different. So this is kind of an interesting one. Can the Crew Dragon dock with the Boeing capsule? That would be. <laughs> we'll I don't fight think it I out. haven't even <laughs> worked that out yet. So one, one really, right now, I want to have uh, both dock with the station. I think that'd be number one. So let's. Look. I hope you guys aren't trying to yeah, figure out how to go yeah. meet, match up together. Yeah, we can work out a teaming arrangement. <laughs> but no, you need the. Uh, you need the. Uh, yeah, the other you need the docking yeah. adapter to dock to. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be pretty important to be able to do it. Um, Hans, one last question. Um, how soon can we expect to see uh, return to flight? Yeah, so um, we are in the, in the process of, of um, uh, return to flight. Basically, at this point in time, uh, we are writing a, a, a report together. Um, we will submit this report. Uh, it's going to be a couple months. Uh, partly, this is a difficult question because there's still tests going on. So tests could show something that um, we haven't expected. It's, hard, it's actually hard to um, schedule a return to flight activity 
in, in general because there's lots of unknowns that you start with and then as you go on you, you, you work your way through this and unknowns become knowns and probable causes in the end of the day. So um, my, my gut feeling is it's going to be we have end of August, um, mid-October, maybe some you know two to three months in this time frame um, depending a little bit on how, how this all works out and, um, and how the tests, also the tests on the next um, flight, flight unit, um, you know, how they, how they work out basically. Okay, well, I think uh, we now have 10 seconds left. So um, I, I want to just say uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all the folks coming in and participating in the session. Um, hopefully it's been helpful to you. Like I said, um, over this next year, pay attention because both of these companies are going to be moving out on delivering their new capabilities. Uh, 